I think the what the microphone is gone. died on a Wednesday, I think, and Matis told me afterwards, that's his brother-in-law, that he had said to his wife that night, or the night before, how can we, you know, how can you sit by and watch him suffering and trying so hard to stretch? Why don't you say that with your brother? I shouldn't have to say it to him. Why don't, what are we doing? Are we waiting for him to come to us? Why don't we have to wait for that? Why don't you say to him, until things are better for you, we'll give you X numbers of dollars a month, and when you're on your feet again, you'll pay us back. And they had planned to make that offer, but they had not made it. Did they help you after he died? No, they said that from that point on, they would buy the children's shoes from then on, and they would send the children to camp from then on, and they would help to send them to school from then on. And they did buy each of the boys a pair of shoes once. And they were well to do? Yeah. Tell me about um, sort of what finally happened with Michelle about his dying. Well, he was in New York for 13 weeks trying to set this book club up and also to find if he could get other kinds of jobs. He was sent by some agency <laughs> to. Uh, for an interview to write for some skin magazine. So he went down to Times Square. He'd never seen these, uh, whatever these sex magazines were. And he went down to buy them. He said he felt like a dirty old man. He hit the magazines and he felt he couldn't do that kind of writing. And when in, when in 54 was this? The 13th? This was years? in New York. No, when in 54? This would have been, since he died in November, this would have been at some point before the 13 weeks, you know, 13 right. weeks. Uh, probably toward, probably in the middle of it, because uh, in between waiting to meet with people and writing. I'm square. Did a his own washing. My mother used to love to make shirts for him. She made him shirts that he used to wash in the basin. Uh, he lived a very skimpy very skimpy life. It was in that period of time that I went to work without telling him. Well, he was back in New York. Yeah, because I, I, I just felt that uh, it would be... So, um, what did you do today earlier? Excuse me, you hear that whistle? Yeah. That means we're recording because we're also getting a, uh... Well, you asked me about... I should take this out of here. What is happening is what it sounds. It sounds in here. If it were here, you wouldn't hear it. You see, if it, uh, in any way, if the microphone picks up uh, the earphones, so it would be better if we'd take them out. Uh, that reminds me of the time uh, I had some pictures to show you of recording a United Nations delegation, which was uh, uh, took place in the uh, summertime at the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. And I had recently come on the job, and so... Uh, when would this have been? This would have been 19... Uh, see, I went to work there in November, 19, uh, seven, uh, 1961. So this would have been the following summer. So I had to put uh, speakers on each side of the patio. It was an enclosed patio. Uh, we used to call it the Parthenon because like a Greek mansion, but the whole thing was, um, the floors were marble. And um, that, that has terrible consequences if you want to record sound. And uh, they were meeting in the patio, and I was sitting under a tree, which was just ridden with bugs, you know, little creatures about an inch long, uh, caterpillar-like things. And I 
uh, was recording the uh, proceedings, but also uh, the, uh, letting the people in the uh, patio, who were seated in the patio, hear through the two speakers. And um, if somebody's mic was turned or the, the volume got a little bit too loud, there was this shriek, this, uh, uh, this uh, playback that you just heard now. And so I wrote gain on it as carefully as I could, getting as much volume as I could. The minute I began to hear any, any little bit of a shriek, I turned it down. And as a consequence, lots of people found that the volume wasn't high enough for them. They began to complain. So I just, meanwhile, these little caterpillars were dropping down my back. And I thought I was absolutely so disciplined because not once did I wince or, or wiggle or do anything. I thought that was, that was you know, heroic enough. Hudgens came over to me, and for some reason I adored that man, I worshipped him. Um, I was in such awe of him, and yet, I don't know what happened, I was always fresh to him, I didn't mean to be. It's almost as if I was so uh, afraid that I uh, was just as sassy as I, I could be, just uh, out of sheer uh, self-consciousness, I guess, I don't know. But <laughs> he came over and said, can't you make the uh, volume a little louder, people can't hear. And I said, I can't, because if I do, you'll get that feedback that you hear from time to time. He said, well, what good is this stuff anyway? And I said, Mr. Hutchins, bless your stars that the technology won't do everything you want it to do, because otherwise there's no use for you or me in this world. <laughs> Oh, can you imagine? I was so humiliated afterwards to have said something like that to <laughs> Anyway, uh, I were, went, yeah, go ahead. You were telling me the last time we talked about uh, Michelle and he was questioned uh, by the committee. Well, you asked me how that came about, and I, it seems to me that I, I told you some of the things that uh, he was active in. And I told you some of the history that got him interested in, in, in uh, uh, communist party. the Communist Party and in a Marxist approach to things. But I didn't tell you why they went after him. I mean, I gave you history that they, were, uh, uh, that they didn't even know either. Um, during the strike of 1940, it began in 1944, um, late in 44, because, um, and it continued for about a year and a half, I think. There were eight unions that were out on strike. They all were members of the, con of the uh, Conference of uh, Studio Unions, the CSU. Uh, there were the electrical workers, the IBEW, and there were the painters and decorators of America, which my union eventually joined as the local. And I think I told you that story when somebody mm -hmm. said, you know, uh, we paint with words, you know. Um, so there were the publicists, the cartoonists, the electricians, the painters, the screen story analysts. Did I mention the publicists? Yes. Uh, and then the uh, set decorators and set designers. And the IA had laid claim to the set designers and set decorators. And um, we were out <laughs> for a long time until the NLRB did, did us in by letting the scabs uh, vote. But um, Michelle had a minor heart attack the first time that he had to go through a picket line because the Screenwriters Guild did not order its members not to go through a picket line. No union did. No union did. So he just extrapolated from his own experience about how rotten he felt with his wife on the picket line having to go through the picket line because his union wouldn't stand, uh, wouldn't protect him. So he organized in every single studio he got a writer to contact the writers in that studio, a director to contact the directors, an actor to contact the actors, and so on down the list. And in each case, he was to ask, they would ask for a weekly pledge. And we established the Hollywood Welfare Association. Some people gave as much as $500 a week. Some people even gave $1,000 a week, very few. Most people gave $50 or $100 a week. But they all, not all, but a great number of people contributed as a result of which we had so much money that no one uh, ever was unable to pay the rent. No child went without a present for, at Christmas time. Uh -huh. Nobody went without clothes and nobody went without gifts for Christmas, you know? Uh, uh, and it 
was a very ingenious scheme that he that he uh, made up and uh, that he invented, and uh, it helped the strike to last as long as it did. Um, so he ran the fund. No, he didn't. No, he didn't run it. I mean, uh, I was the. I forgot what I was. I was either the vice president or the treasurer or something. Uh, no, Strikers. Uh, the the thing was incorporated. And Strikers uh, ran the thing. But there was no secret about the fact that he had invented it, and so that's the thing they questioned him about. Uh, that was that. Uh, and I just thought that. Uh, I should set the I should make that set the record straight and make that clear. I'm, I'm stuttering again today. Mm -hmm. There was another thing that made me a little unhappy. Uh, the last time we talked, or the, to uh, the time before, uh, I was talking about my experiences in the Communist Party, mm -hmm. and I hope that I make it clear for my kids or anybody who listens to this thing that uh, I regard that period as one of the best in my life, uh, where I was idealistic and where I lived by my ideals. But it's a curious consequence of the McCarthy period that has never gone away, and I've talked to other people who admit the same thing. We are uh, brazen, or we force ourselves to be brazen, or we for force ourselves to be candid, if, for a less strong word, about our experience in the party, but we're always a little uneasy about saying it. And we are always prepared for the fact that, and the fact experience dictates that we will, lose the confidence of friends to whom we confide uh, our political past. Um, I think I have told you that uh, friends like Edgardo never totally credited my opinion, uh, whereas they would someone else's opinion. They just assumed 10 years after the fact, 20 years after the fact, 30 years after leaving the Communist Party, that my views had to be tainted by the party line. So one, we were never trusted. Two, underneath it all, we never really totally trust someone else with this information. Uh, I myself forced myself to talk about it because I think that one of the terrible results of the McCarthy period was that uh, the level of conversation in this country uh, reached a, a lower common denominator. People began to self-censor themselves. They do it in writing, and they certainly do it in speech, and they do it in the way in which they attach themselves to political causes and things like that. And it occurred to me after we talked about it that uh, people who were involved in Watergate or Irangate don't feel this need to justify themselves after the fact. Mm -hmm. But people, you know, interestingly enough, people who were engaged in left-wing things, knowing that they were suspect as being not loyal to their country, when in reality they were often, you know, far more patriotic than people who didn't take any responsibility for what was going on in the country, these people, um, slowly absorbed the perception that other people had of them. And when they talk about the experience of the party, they are defensive about it. They're not proud about it. Um, I went, I, ha I had to go through some papers the other day, and I came across a statement that I wrote for my brother-in-law, because when he was interviewed about his life, the um, man who's writing a a uh, history of his entire family from the time of rebels, uh, Hiram Revels, on, uh, sort of seized on all the anti-communist things that Revels said, and it upset Revels terribly because he said that he uh, uh, said that he, that he did not leave the Communist Party because he was disillusioned, you know, um, and. With, with, not disillusioned with the party, he had other reasons it, because he felt. In his case, the party had veered away from its uh, concentration on uh, fairness and justice for blacks, and that they were concerned with other issues which the party believed were more important, more pressing. And he wanted to devote all his energies to things about the blacks. That was not my reason for leaving the party, but I, I thought that. Uh, 
many of the things that I wrote because I ghost wrote that for him. Uh, I wrote because it was my kind of a statement and uh, I just want to read you a paragraph from them. I hear t people today bashing the party for all its mistakes and I understand them because the party made plenty of mistakes. But I'm not one of them who bashes the party. I'm proud today when I look back on those early years in the party, when I remember that the party was in the forefront fighting for the right to organize unions, for paid vacations and sick leave, seniority rights, and all the other working conditions we take for granted today as a legal right. In the 1930s, the party was the first to rally against fascism, and the positions it took on issues in those years stand up very well today. But it's it's I find it very interesting, Ronnie, that if you were a shit who did something like, you know, a, a, a rag gate, or you, if you were a Colonel uh, North, uh, who did really things that violated the Constitution. I don't remember a single act in all the years of my party, of my, of my uh, uh, what's the word I want, uh, that a, a single act of mine or of anybody else's that I knew in those years that was a violative of the Constitution, mm -hmm. you know? So I want, I want to make that clear if it hadn't been clear. And also, I think I called Zelman Cowan, the dean of the law school at, um, I think I said Auckland, but it was Melbourne, Australia. I think you corrected yourself later in our I conversation did. you said you thought yeah. that it was Melbourne. Okay. After all. I think that those are the two things that I... Uh, wanted to correct. Okay. I wouldn't go on that. If you want. Go back to, I think when we were talking last time, we were talking about Michelle in New York. Right. And the letter that he wrote to you. The letter he, oh, he, I've had, I have a whole box full of letters from the From that time? Um, yeah. I said the, the only separation we had in our 13 years of being together. Mm -hmm. It's the only time we were separated. So I had, I had letters four or five times. The mail was good in those days. <laughs> Would it be of any help to read a couple of those into the record? Or do you, to give us a flavor of Michelle? Or do you think maybe the, the one that you showed me, perhaps? Um, well... Or would you prefer yeah. not? No, I'll leave that. I'll, uh, I'll, you know, I, I'm destroying the letters I got through over the years, slowly going through them, especially love letters. I, I think uh, I, people in my life have a right to their privacy, mm -hmm. so I'm not, you know, I'm not keeping any of those. I'm going through them slowly, but uh, that letter, of Michelle's, uh, uh, I'll leave for my kids. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'll leave all the letters that he wrote me, and they can just destroy them. Most of it is the day-to-day -day stuff, like telling me to thank Mama because she made shirts for him out of the material that he didn't have to iron, so he could wash the shirt every every night in the basin and hang it up. Yeah. And you know, um, they were filled with little day-by-day uh, -day reports of whom he talked to and whom he saw and who promised him what, mm -hmm. which wasn't. Uh, How many months yeah. was he there? He was gone for thirteen weeks. From that, when to when? Uh, well, if you back up, he came home on Halloween. Yeah. Uh, talk. It's not being. Uh, we're not. <laughs> I know. We're he not came home on Halloween. And what year? Um, uh, let me tell you, he was. Uh, it, this is 1954. Uh -huh. uh, he had been gone for 13 weeks, and he called up one. He called up on a Friday, Halloween in that year, 54, fell on a Saturday. And he called up Friday and said, I'm coming home tomorrow. And I said, tomorrow? It's Halloween. The kids, the kids have got their costumes. <laughs> They're all, you know, and I thought to myself, it's too soon because uh, you, you had to kind of put yourself into some kind of a glass bubble uh, to survive while he was gone. And you played games with yourself, and you didn't allow yourself to get too upset missing him. And I thought, I can't shift gears that fast. So he said, well, ask the kids if they mind, because he, he already had his flight and would be coming back about 6 in the evening. Ask the kids if they mind giving up Halloween. Uh, so or what, ask them what they want to do. Do they want to go out trick-or-treating or 
go to the airport to miss me and I'll change my ticket if I have to. So I asked the kids, and of course they were so excited to see that Daddy was coming home, they said they would give up trick-or-treating. So we went to the airport and met him, and I remember Michelle had a very big head, you've seen pictures, I have. big Slavic head, unusual head size. <laughs> we uh, got to the airport early enough to wait for the plane, which meant that it was dinner time, and these little kids. So we uh, ate at the airport, and all, all of us sat at the counter, it was the only place that was free. Michelle hung up his hat, and when we went to leave to go home, the hat was gone. Oh. <laughs> he kept saying, but there's nobody who has it, and as big as I am, what did they take it for? Uh -huh. So, uh, back up from 13 weeks from October 31st, and that's when he went to New York. Uh, so, went sometime York. in mid-August, or early August, I'd yeah. say, August of 54. Yeah. And he left with instructions to me that, you know, I was not to take on any jobs uh, because the family, the, the, the equilibrium of the family would depend on me. And I got worried about, money. you know, money and uh, the fact, even though he was in New York, he was the one who was still responsible for handling everything. So I, that's how I came to work for Arthur Marshall. I went to work for him five hours a day. Now, how did you know him? How did you set up any contact with him? Uh, well, I didn't. Uh, Bernie Scadron, who was an accountant, and I think he told me the story that after Michelle died, uh, friends committed themselves yes. to a gift for me for every month. Mm -hmm. Well, Bernie Scadron is an accountant who was the accountant for all those people. He was a, uh, his clientele were actors and directors and uh, mostly Hollywood people. Uh, he was the accountant for Arthur Marshall, and Arthur Marshall said he needed somebody. Now, who to, is Arthur Marshall? Arthur Marshall is what? was a, uh, a psychiatrist who later became a psychoanalyst. He actually helped to establish a Benninger Foundation, the Benninger Hospital uh, clinic, on the level that it was established. They used to put out two psychiatrists a year, mm -hmm. and. Um, that's a fascinating story that we'll get to sometime. Uh, but uh, I began working for Arthur just mornings, I think, three times a week. Back yeah. up. So the other man told him about you? Is yeah. that it? That oh, Arthur, Arthur said to schedule, I need somebody you know, to write letters for me and, and do things like that. And. Um, he really needed somebody to write speeches and ghost for him because he was a good healer but he was very inarticulate. So Bernie suggested me. See, Bernie knew. Uh, the reason Michelle forbid me to go to work is that I used to call myself, uh, he forbid me to go to take on a job while he was in New York because while, while he was blacklisted but still living, you know, in Los Angeles, still with me, uh, I would take on jobs like with uh, Hubley's cartoons, they, went, they did a, a cartoon version of Finian's Rainbow, for example. Or Vera Caspery, who wrote uh, Laura and a lot of other uh, uh, books. Uh, screenwriters who were uh, anxious to give blacklisted people uh, or their families as much work as possible to throw jobs their way. Uh, I had a very light a uh, typewriter, an Adler, which weighed less than the usual uh, portables. And I used to call myself a cool girl with a typewriter because I would go to your house and service you. And uh, so I had been doing that, and Michelle wanted me to stop doing any of those things so I could attend to the children and I could be at home. And he didn't want me ravaged with fatigue by taking on work and, and, and looking after the kids by myself as well. So without telling him, I told uh, I, I went to work for Arthur, and in fact, there's a um, there's a well, every, everything about me has a story. <laughs> That's good. Like, um, when he came back, I was using just a little portable at Arthur's office, and I thought I could do better typing if I had my Adler. So Michelle carried the Adler for me. And just a few, you know, he was only home ten days before he died. So it was only a few days after he came back, maybe a week after he came back, that he carried the machine to Arthur's office for me. And Arthur came out after his patient had left. 
and I introduced them. And he said, uh, well, what do you think of your wife? Aren't you, you know, aren't you proud of her? And he said, well, yes, I am. Uh, I'm very pleased with the way she made out. Um, now, if I could only believe that she knew how to make up her mind. That, no, excuse me. If I could only believe that she knew how to come to a decision, I would be greatly, uh, I would feel great relief. I was very hurt. I mean, this is a man I've just started working for, and he tells this guy that I don't know how to make a decision, which was absolutely true. I didn't know how to make a decision. And I used to plague him, you know, with the, 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 the tiniest things. Do you think I should do this? Do you think I should do that? And for him to tell a stranger and a man I'm working for, something like that, and it was especially noticeable because Michelle was never shy about telling me, about criticizing me, even if it was only about my stocking seams not being straight. He was never loath to tell me that I did something wrong, mm -hmm. but never in front of anybody else. He's always praised me in front of other people. So that I remember that very um, starkly. It was so unusual and it hurt my feelings. Michelle had been dead for a year. And... I got into an argument with Arthur because he said I was bothering him with too many details. And I said defensively, well, you know I can't make decisions. I said, don't you remember Michelle said? And I stopped. And I said, he knew he was going to die. And he was asking you to look after me. And Arthur said, yes, I, I have always known that. And I said, and you knew it when he said that? He said, no, but he was... He died a few days afterwards, so I realized that that's what he was asking. I still can't talk about it. So he knew. Anyway, he'd been in New York 13 weeks, and he called Friday and said, I want to come home. Well, uh, it was sudden, and when he got home, he didn't say anything until a few days later he said that he had had an appointment to, be, to meet Ralph ben Kaim, who was a man who was fronting for him on that book club for the Jewish youth. And he got the address wrong. They were supposed to meet at a Swedish smorgasbord place. And he thought it was uh, West 57th, and he went to that address, and it was East 57th. Right, but it would cost 10 cents to take the bus, So, and he was also uh, a very prompt man, so he walked very, very, very fast. And he said that he got indigestion, he got such terrible indigestion. Well, afterwards I realized that that's not what he had, indigestion. That was not indigestion that he had. And that was just that happened the day before he decided to come home. So I think he knew. Well, I know that he knew because the night before he died, um, he was sitting in front of a bookshelf that he had built himself into a recess. It was very pretty. It was very nicely done. And the bottom part were shelves like this, which, which had doors covering it. And God, Ronnie, when you look at how disorderly I am and how chaotic and how it takes me... It's, it's, it's such a commotion for me to work through with things, with things, and order my papers around. It's incredible that Michelle and I never quarreled about that because he was so oily. He always knew exactly where everything was. So he opened these doors and he sat on the floor and he went through the scripts. He said, "Now I have a ten, he, There was a play he wrote with, uh, that he translated for Bruno Frank and, and sort of rewrote uh, a little bit." Um, the Emperor Dowager's last Emperor Dowager of China. Wonderful play. And uh, he said, I've got a 10% interest in this. Uh, these plays are all fireside theater. They owe me 2% royalty every time it's played. Uh, mm -hmm. Other thing. And I said to him, as he went through these things, and um, this is uh, uh, Tony Bart Bartley, I think. Bartley or Barton? Uh, Deborah Carr's first husband. He said, uh, I have a 50% interest. And he just went through all these things. And I said, um, what are you doing all that for? I said, you think you were preparing me for your death or something? I said, listen, I had a good 
dose. I've got a good taste of widowhood, and I don't like it. So he laughed, you know. That was the night before he died. Well, now, you don't, you don't come home and go through these things and clear up these things for no unless, for, for no reason, unless something has happened, and you think that uh, you better, you know, uh, tie up loose ends or things. He, he went to the doctor the day before, the day, the day that he had the heart attack, mm -hmm. and uh, she said he was swallowing too much air. He was 54, 55? Mm -hmm. No, he was 50, 55. He was born in 1899, he died in 54. So what happened on the day that he died? Um, I... I don't remember whether I worked that day or not. But I... In the middle of the week, probably? Yeah, it was the middle of the week. It was, he, uh, it was the middle of the week he was he'd buried on a Friday, uh, so he died on Thursday. So on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday night, I remember I made a steak tartare for him because he loved it. And uh, played with his boys that day. That night. Well, it was right after dinner that he threw up, and uh, he lay down for a while, and then. Uh, he said that he, he just wanted to lie down for a while. He didn't tell me, you see. And I was beginning to take care of the boys, you know, to get them ready for a bath when he came out of his room. And he said, do you have any painkillers? Well, I didn't have any painkillers. I had to ask for it. Yeah. And I said, what's the matter? He said, well, I, do, I just have some pain, and I think, I just thought maybe if he had a painkiller. And it was raining. And... Uh, I said, I'd better call Paul, who was his niece. She was his doctor, but his niece. And I said, maybe I'll call Paul. He said, no, no, don't do that. Don't bring the girl out in the rain. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just got... He just looked so bad. And I don't know why I sat there as long as I did. And he said to me, you look frightened. And I said, well, I am. And I said, let me call Paul. And he said, well, just ask her on the telephone. So I called her and said, he doesn't want you to come because it's the rain. I forgot that I, we had a good friend one block away. I, then it even occurred to me. Uh, I said, he doesn't want you to come out, but he wants to know what we should do. And she said, I'm coming. And she came with her mother. Uh, well, actually, this was his, her brother. <laughs> Friday had such a long time. Why did I do this still? Do you want to know? No. Uh, so she sent for the fire department, and they stayed with him a long time, giving him oxygen. And Dilly said they weren't allowed to stay any longer. And she gave him a shot, and uh, then she went out and she called a heart specialist. Mm -hmm. And she, he said, we're taking him straight to the hospital, and... Uh, she said, she, do you think we should be moving him the way he is? And uh, he said, you want him to die in this house with the children around? I didn't know that. She told me that later. So they took him in the ambulance. They wouldn't let me in the ambulance. He was so bad. I didn't know it, but they did. They wouldn't let me in the ambulance. So uh, she drove me. We followed the ambulance. And uh, they wouldn't let me in the same room with him because they said, Everything that could be done was done, and you want him to live, and he'll talk to you. If you go in the room, he'll talk to you. Okay. So I went in and told him that I would be outside if he wanted me, and I lay down on a, on a bench, and somewhere around two, I think, the nurse said to me, I think you should go home. He's resting. Mm -hmm. And so I went home. Two in the morning? Like yeah. That. Paula took me home, and then at about quarter of five or four thirty the telephone rang and the nurse said uh, I think you should come down so I called Lucy who lives just a few blocks away and uh, all the things Lucy's such a careful driver she stopped at every at every red light at every stoplight I said to her we can go through the light she said just when you need a cup 
she was a cup that would lead us. But she stopped at every red light. <laughs> it was just incredible. I don't understand that to this day. I don't understand how she could do that. Wait, but I want to get some Kleenex. Richard Littman, Littman, who would die very soon himself, but who was a hero of the blacklist period, wonderful man. Um, he was sent for by friends of ours. I don't know how word went. It, the word went around like wildfire, mm -hmm. and the phone rang at one point, and it was Lori Tidelman wanting to know how Michelle was, and he said. I don't want anybody to know I'm sick. I'll have, a, I'll have trouble getting a job if it gets around that I'm sick. And uh, so I said, well, I didn't tell anybody. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll stop it or something. And uh, Richard Lipman came because Lori sent him. And, this was that morning? Then? Yeah, that morning. And uh, examined him. And he said to me, it, everything that could be done has been done. And it's just going to take time for the medicine to work. He's got a big body. Uh, he was a big man, big was he frame. tall man? Yeah, he was six feet and mm -hmm. uh, big frame. Heavy set. Right? Yeah, yeah, he was overweight. He should. He was almost two hundred pounds, or about two hundred pounds. So he was a big person. He was a big man. He said he's got a big body and for it to go through uh, for medicine to get to get to where it needs to go. And uh, then the next thing that happened was that the nurse took his blood pressure. And he looked down at it. He could always read upside down. <laughs> he was very proud of that. He would go for an interview, or he'd go to, to interview somebody for a story on the paper, and he'd see all these things on the desk, and he would read everything upside down. So he read, he read the uh, what the nurse wrote, and she thought you know, because it was upside down, it was all right. And he said to me, "I just wish those figures were reversed." He meant he, the, whatever the top figure is. Um, uh, so I didn't know what that meant, and I still don't to this day. And the nurse said, don't talk to him. So I went and stood by the window and looked down over the freeway. And I remember thinking to myself, he's got to have it quiet when he gets out. And the children can't be, you know, running around. they can't be running around, but neither can you keep kids absolutely quiet. It's a tiny little house that we live in. So I'm going to see to it that he goes out to the Motion Picture Relief Fund. They have these wonderful cottages, uh, and the wonderful hospital and, and nursing home in the valley. And uh, then immediately went through my head that they wouldn't want him to go because he, had, he was blacklisted. And I thought, I will, I will see to it that he gets in. I mean, they're not, he's been contributing that goddamn uh, fund with every paycheck. And he's going to get into that place so that he can have it quiet. And I was making plans for how I would have, you know, see to that he had good care and good quiet. Uh, and the nurse said, this is Michelle. And I turned around and she said, I think he's gone. And I went over and I put my head on his chest and I could hear, I could hear something. And I said, if he, if he isn't gone, I can hear, I can hear it gurgling. And uh, so they sent for a doctor, and he said to me, it's just the blood all receding and leaving the arteries. And that's it. It was just awful fast. So he died on a Thursday, and he had to be buried the next day because he can't bury anybody on Sabbath. So it had to be before noon. And I don't know where all the people came from, but they. The thing you heard people say the most was who was, the, who was there to talk to. He was so good to talk to. I was so bad at him when he came back from New York because the time he was gone, they lined up like people, you know, taking numbers. They lined up. This one had a story to discuss. This one had a marital problem. This one. I was so mad at him for all the people who came. And I wanted to go away that weekend. And he said, be patient. I'm hot right now. I'm really hot. I'm on to so, you know, he had three or four things that were about to break. He said, uh, 
just give it another couple of weeks and I'll take you away, I promise. But just let me get these things solid. Though I could kill him. All these years, and I've never stopped listening. Well, did you tell David and his brother that day, or your about, mom, about the, their dad, or your mom did, or about the uh, fact that he had died? Yeah. Tony punched me in the stomach and said, "Then you got to get me another daddy." And uh, David's reaction. Um, I don't remember David's reaction because probably it was just normal to say anything to hit me. But I do remember that two days afterwards, people came and they brought toys and they brought toys and they brought toys and presents. And he said, gosh, when your father dies, you get so many presents that if a kid wasn't nice, he could wish, <laughs> he could wish his father would die. <laughs> and I said very quickly, uh, Kids always wish for their father or their mother to die because they get angry with them sometimes. But wishes never, never made anybody die. Ever. Ever. So I was, I was uh, sufficiently in focus mm -hmm. to do what I was necessary to be done and quickly to get that clear, to make that clear. And another time he came to me, and that must have been almost, almost the first day when I told him, as a matter of fact about his daddy having died. He said, well, now I'm the man of the house. And I realized people had been saying that to him. And I said, no, you're not the man of the house. You're the oldest son in the house. Mm -hmm. um, but I was so angry at people saying, you'll have to look after your mom. You're the man of the house now. And um, Lucy was in the hospital with you there? Yeah, she, she was outside. Uh, in the hall the whole time. She went in for a minute to see Michelle, then she stayed outside. And, uh, and she took over from then on. The Hill, what, Hill did Crest, she do? Huh? what did she do? Well, the Hillcrest Country Club was only a few blocks away. Well, she didn't even drive there. She simply called up and had people come in taxis or bring. She just kept that, that house going with food. Uh, all that day, the day of the funeral, and uh, I, I watched a, I watched a television play today, which was called Saying Kaddish, mm -hmm. and uh, it's an Orthodox Jewish family mourning the death of a mother with a sister, with one daughter living in California, and the other daughter living at home, who has taken care of the mother. And the friends come, and there's a minion, uh, uh, ten people, and they say Kaddish every day. And they sit Shiva. Oh, it's, uh, and I was watching that, and weeping through it all, but thinking how stupidly I behaved. And I think I damaged Tony especially, and probably David. Because instead of sitting at home and mourning and letting the people, I mean, we kept finding notes from people uh, the following week, people came by to see us, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be there, you know? Uh, mostly I'd be at the Astros. And um, I didn't allow myself to have a mourning period. I just denied it. And the whole thing, uh, my, my, um, the way in which I played a game with myself was um, very starkly shown about a year later by Tony, who, Tony and I have always had kind of a symbiotic relationship, at least we did in, in, in the early years when he was growing up, because he said, he called me into his room one day and he said, Mommy, I have a secret to tell you. Daddy is not dead. And he said, Daddy wouldn't do that to us. He said, he sneaked out of the hospital on a very slow bus to New York. And when Daddy finds out how good we are, he's coming back. And I, w I was very quiet by saying, ah, no, that's not true. Daddy is dead. 
uh, he's, well, I didn't see him die. You see, I didn't let the kids go to the funeral. A very, you know, uh, often said it was a mistake, but other people begged me not to have him come, and it was a terrible mistake, because he said I didn't see him die. And so I never gave the kids a chance to, to make that farewell. And the Irish and the Jews, um, people make fun of them. They have, the Irish have the wakes, the Jews have shiva. But it's a very healthy way to discharge the grief, to face it, to walk right into the middle of the storm, and then get on with your life. But I didn't do that. I ran. I ran like hell. And when Tony said that, my mother, I, I had gone out with Lucy that night to a concert. And my mother was still there because I went into I, I went in to see if the kids were asleep when I came back, and that's when Tony uh, told me. So I asked my mother, please, to stay. And I got into the car and I went over to Lucy's to ask her for a drink. But I, what I was doing on the, as I drove over to Lucy's was saying out loud, I've been very good. I've taken very good care of your children. When are you coming back? Because that was my fantasy. That was what I kept telling myself. You wouldn't do that to me. You would never. He's the one person in this world I knew would never leave me, would never let me down. And uh, I began to bounce. After that, that I went to therapy uh, with Dr. Townsend, who reminded me after a few weeks, Mrs. Michelle, your husband is dead. And I said, Well, I know that. And she said, Do you? Do you? Do you really? So that was part of the therapy, was to come to terms with the fact, I mean, really to convince myself that uh, to stop playing this game. After he died, did you continue to work for Arthur Marshall? Oh, Arthur came over immediately, hearing about it, and put me to work full time, immediately. Yeah, I worked for Arthur for eight years after that, mm -hmm. and uh, I loved Arthur. I loved him so much. I really did. And uh, oh, was already, like? already there was a flirtation uh, with, between us before you know while Michelle was gone, and uh, Michelle picked up on it. <laughs> did he? <laughs> oh, sure. Um, he never, see, I, I did very little flirting during uh, the marriage, actually. But what little flirting there was, because usually somebody started. I don't remember ever ever starting it myself. But Michelle used to be very amused because I'd come home with my glove to him, and he said, as long as I brought the body home, <laughs> how should he object if somebody, somebody got me all stared up? <laughs> Do you think that Marshall was attracted to you, too, after oh, Michelle I, was Oh, I know that. Oh, I know it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know that. As a matter of fact, he loved me very dearly. There's no, there's no doubt about it. We never became lovers, but we were much closer than lovers because... Was he uh, married? Yeah. Is that, yeah. And continued to be oh yeah the time oh yeah how did you get through that first year what what did you do to emotionally well I look back now I think I spent too much time with the Astros but the, the, the <laughs> boys the boys were with us most of the time uh, well I got let's see on the on December he died in he, di he died in Early November. November yeah. Uh, he died in November, a week before our wedding anniversary. Or no, let's see, our wedding anniversary was two days afterwards. He died, he was buried on the 18th. And two days later was our wedding anniversary. And Molly, <laughs> Molly Wilson, who lived just a block away, our kids once went to um, nursery school together, had bought um, the... Um, Elizabeth Browning, uh, uh, Browning? Uh, uh, the Portuguese uh, sonnets, from the Portuguese. Sonnet, sonnets from the Portuguese, because Michelle had bought that for me, and somebody had borrowed it, and I was griping one day about the fact that I didn't have the sonnets and I loved reading them. So she bought a very pretty little leather-bound thing, uh, but she bought it weeks before, and she came over and she didn't know what to do you know, whether that was appropriate to give me a gift on my anniversary. And I said to her, don't, don't be so, 
don't be so uh, uneasy, Molly. If he were alive today, I wouldn't be talking to him anyway, because he would have forgotten our anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> so I was busy making jokes like that, and I was busy showing that you know I could do. I had. I took on three jobs. I worked for the Civic Light Opera. First of all, I worked for Bob Wise. I don't know whether I told you that story. That Bob was one of the Bob Luton unit. And he had hit it with the setup. He really hit it and became a very successful director. I mean, financially successful. He had been a good director before that. And uh, coming back on the Queen Elizabeth, uh, I think he had already, I don't remember when he had made The Sound of Music yet, but uh, he thought to himself, I, I'm going to offer Michelle some work to, as a, you know, reading books as a, to, to uh, search for story material for me. And it won't be much that I will offer, but uh, um, it will help a little bit. In those days, he was offering $1,500 a year. In those days, you could somehow manage a little bit. It was $100 a month and uh, not... Friends weren't that high. Yeah. Well, it, not, yeah, and uh, food, uh, everything was a lot less, so that you didn't manage well, but you managed somehow. And uh, and he didn't expect that it was going to be our sole source of income anyway, but he thought it would help and, and, and be steady. And so when he got back, when the ship docked, he heard about Michelle, so he came to see me and he offered it to me. So I earned $1,500 a year working for him, and then Eleanor Pinkham paid me for the Civic Light Opera $500 a year to uh, call to their attention any vehicle that would do for a stage production for a musical, so that as I was reading for Bob, I could also be reading for her. So I got $2,000 a year out of that, and I worked from 9 to 3 for Arthur. I mean, that when I said it was full-time, it was 9 mm -hmm. to 3 because I had to get home by the time the yes. children were home. And uh, I try to keep busy. I remember being so numb and so frightened and so afraid of not being able to be alert to the kids that I played a game with myself for the first, maybe the first year, in which these were not my children. Uh, I was working for someone, looking after their children, and my life depended on doing a good job. They had ways of watching me to know whether I was doing a good job with them or not. And uh, so I, you see, I distanced myself from everything. Which is why years later, when I had the mastectomy, and uh, Tom Hunt told me there was a, a therapy group, uh, group uh, that wanted people to talk about what it felt like to be in a life-threatening situation, he thought that since I was so articulate, uh, I would be a good candidate. And when they asked me, they were already filled. Uh, they already filled all the places that they had, but they asked me, why would you want to be part of it? And I said, because I've always looked at my life retros retrospectively, and for once I want to be present in my own life. I want to be present at what happens to me. I don't want to take it out afterwards when I have no support system around me and look at it. And, and, that, and that's the terrible thing that I did. I... When I was surrounded by a support system, by people who would have supported me, I didn't lean on them for support. I was the brave woman. I was the person who coped. Uh, I did, you know, I was, I was denying it so that when I faced my grief years later, it was curiously distorted, and there was no support system around. There was no one to know what I was going through with the kind of sympathy that, for example, Phyllis or Ruthie gets now because people know what they're going through. Nobody could guess what I was going through if it happened so many years later. But on Christmas, I took the kids uh, by train to San Francisco, uh, and we went by sleeper. So just the three of you? Yeah. And um, then there were, I don't know, there was one that I, I, 
I sent them off by helicopter to Disneyland and I rushed in the car because, you know, saving one affair that way to meet them at a certain point. I was always trying to give them some kind of new experience that was an adventure uh, to keep them distracted. And I was stunned. And only a year ago, I mentioned the fact that I had um, tried to find different ways uh, to keep them, uh, you know, interested. Uh, and David said, uh, oh, you did that, but we always, I always knew that you were just trying to get rid of us. And I was so stunned by that. And, and so was he by my reaction when I said to him, I was hanging on by my nails. You know, I, I, I didn't know how I was going to manage or get through, get through being alive. Um, so I had to distract them. And that's when I began for the first time to use the Jewish holidays um, as a tradition uh, with my sister Gertrude and her children because I had to create some kind of a family. We were not a family anymore. I didn't know how to make a family. and. Uh, You said you've spent a lot of time at the Ostros with Mr. and Mrs. and Lucy. Yeah. Uh, Lucy had not yet gone. Lucy would go to Europe in another, uh, a, a year and a half after Michelle died, she went to Europe to live for 22 years. Uh, but they included us. Uh, you and the boys. Yes, in, uh, in everything. And uh, they were very good to us. And Lucy's. Our friendship stems from that time because Lucy, well, it stems from the earlier time when she came to sit with me mm -hmm. uh, when Michelle was uh, going to be questioned by the mm -hmm. committee mm -hmm. on un American activity, uh, Committee on un American mm -hmm. Activities. Have you known me to study it so much as I do these days? No, yeah. I just when it's a hard thing to talk about. Well, no, but I, I seem I seem to have a thick tongue generally these days. I don't know what it, what it is. But when I went to work at the center in 1961, I went up on the day of my anniversary, November 20th, and it was a rainy day, very very hard rainy day. I could hardly the windshield. Wipers could hardly keep up with the rain, and I think there was more rain inside the car than there was on the outside. I was weeping bitter. I was terrified. I was just terrified. I was going to be um, recording. I was going to be working with 20 mics. I didn't know how to thread a, a tape machine even. I was going to be dealing with uh, academic material and political material, journalist material, you know, on a level that I didn't know whether I could even, I didn't even, let me back up, I didn't even know that I'd be able to follow the conversations, no less edit them into radio programs. And I wept for my husband on that day, and for years after that, I literally dragged him up out of the grave to help me. I, you know, I really got through that job because of him. Something would come back to me, a conversation describing uh, the labor policy of the German government, and I would be able then to look up something and, or, or to ask somebody and to confirm and make it part of my continuity or make it part of a question for an interview. All sorts of things that that man had told me about, talked to me about, came back and I could draw on them. And, uh, In the in the year or the time right after Michelle died, how how did your family enter into the picture? Your mom, who was well, in Hollywood, and your my, two sisters, both. My one sister was living in in uh, San Jose by then. That's Gertie. He was living in San Jose. Lee was living in San Francisco. Both married with children. Both married with children. Uh, I begged both my sisters to have their husbands call and say, this is your uncle, and to talk to the boys. Not once, not once did either sister ever do anything of the sort. No one ever. But I have to say that Gertie 
Gertie, uh, we visited her in San Jose on some other occasion. And I remember that uh, she was so broke herself, and she said, do you need any money? I can get some money. Um, she had my mother's trick of always hiding money somehow. Uh, my mother used to do that. When we li were living in Mineola, my father would would be out of work, and my mother, uh, we would have the uh, $120 interest on the mortgage to pay, for that's the second mortgage, uh, twice a year. And the, more, the interest date would come due, and my father would say to my mother, I don't have any money. She said, look, don't look at me, Joe. I don't have the money this year. I didn't have anything to, to save with. And the day came and my mother would, she would have her money. She always had a way of putting aside. And then we lost the house because my father was so sure that she would come through with that $120. Um, and that one time? And that one time she couldn't. I mean, things were just so hard. She couldn't. And uh, we lost the house. So there was a time when Gertrude did try to help after she, the divorce? She offered to help financially, and she was, um, once she moved to Los Angeles, she was very glad, you know, when we begin, we had a circus party, at, that's like a harvest, the mm -hmm. Thanksgiving thing we do outdoors, and I have a picture of the dancing that we did, you, know, you, de you decorate with, you hang apples and, and carrots and, and, and mm -hmm. things like that, and... Uh, we began to do the Passover, and we did the Hanukkah. Hanukkah we used to do while Michelle was alive, but that was only for, you know, mm -hmm. and the little Hanukkah de decorations that I have of the King uh, uh, Antiochus and uh, the Judas Maccabee, uh, those things Michelle and I made together uh, years, you know, maybe the last year before uh, he died, the last Hanukkah before he died. And we used to do this thing with the nuts, mm -hmm. which... Um, Actually, I think I invented. Um, Do the boys ever talk to you about, say, the, the late 50s, their perception of what growing up with just you now at that point was, and how does it differ at all from your perception of what was going on? No, they very often have said, I don't remember that. Or, you know, I, you know they, they say, I don't remember him. I'll say, Do you remember Daddy doing such and such? No, I don't remember that. No, I don't remember that. And yet, when left to themselves, and I'm not saying, do you remember, do you remember, uh, they'll chuckle every once in a while, say, Daddy wants, and then they'll tell a story. Uh, Did they talk much about the time after he died, when they were, after all, still boys, being brought up by you, by yourself? Do they talk now about mm -hmm. that? Do they, I mean... Uh, David has said... Uh, when I, when I talk about how guilty I am about uh, Tony, because he, he changed with Michelle's death. Tony had been the sunniest, most loving child you've ever seen in your life, the sweetest, sweetest disposition. And from the time Michelle died, Tony has always been self-destructive. Well, he's always done something to wreak uh, some kind of humiliation or to bring some kind of uh, uh, disapproval on himself. Uh, Rick Baum, uh, I think, joined in with a whole bunch of kids at, at Kate to make uh, Tony's life miserable. Uh, it's one reason I can't look at him without hating him. I, I do act politely, but I'm stuck at a dinner table next to him. They perceived him as a victim and... Took, that, uh, yes, took their always. When he was in school, for example, when uh, I had to take him out of Westland and put him into public school. Well, in those years, they didn't teach kids to write cursive yet. So Tony was still trying to catch up. So the first week, he got maybe a 14 on something, and the next week he got an 18, and the next week he got a 30, you know. So the teacher sent for me and said, this child came with recommendations saying that he was a brilliant student. Now, you know they had to have lied. Look at these marks. And I looked at them, and I said, well, every week they're a little better. Don't you think that this might be perhaps connected with the fact that he is, he's being forced to write cursive in this class? And every week he's learning a little, he's being able to manage it a little bit quicker. 
but that it's not that he doesn't know the answers, it's that he can't write cursive quickly enough. And uh, so it was in that class with this woman's disapproval and her impatience with him. <laughs> when the U2 was shot down, uh, they were all talking uh, in, current, in what I call current events, but I think they call it something else, social studies or whatever it is. <laughs> They said for me again, because what happened? All the kids are condemning the Russians for what they've done. And Tony raises his hand and says, but we don't know all those information, all the information yet. Maybe it was a spy plane. Maybe Eisenhower, President Eisenhower hasn't told the truth. She said, Tony Michelle, do you realize that you are defending a socialist country? And he said, oh, no, ma'am. Russia is not a socialist country. The only place where we have real socialism is in the kibbutz of Israel. Oh, you can see in Israel. That's wonderful. It's what a, a wonderful, story. It's a wonderful story. But they said to me, but you know, Tony knew that that was going to upset her. You think? Oh, yeah. And they, uh, another time they said for me at Reseda, uh, he was doing something. What's else. Reseda? Reseda High School. Oh. We were, we were, we were, uh, Reseda Junior High is where... Uh, he had just started school there, and uh, he was doing something. Uh, I forgot what it was. And I said to the, the counselor, I said, when you're busy putting all these round pegs, you know, into the little holes, and I said, you get one that's shaped a little differently, and it goes, hey, you can't quite get it in. I said, aren't you thrilled? She looked at me and said, well, I see where he gets it from. <laughs> <laughs> He has, from that day on, in some way, I feel that he was blaming himself because mm-hmm. he gave it. He gave it away with when we. Then he sees how good we are. Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, I, I've tried to tell that story and I've tried to talk about it. But he, you know, if, if I experienced Michelle's death in this terrible, distorted way, think what the boys mm-hmm. uh, have done. And once I said. The defense of, I was offending Tony for something, and I said something about I did him a great deal of damage um, in the way I didn't face Daddy's death. And uh, David said it made a remark about the fact that I uh, Tony wasn't the only one who was damaged. And the fact is that Phyllis and I became friends because of an incident that happened at Westland School. David began to shinny up the top of the trees, and that's where he sat. And in fact, the school hired a male teacher for David's class because they felt he needed to have a male teacher, and it worked very well. They really liked the man, Jack, and Jack came to our house for dinner and so on. But the school recognized that this was a terrible blow for this child because he began just to stay up in the tree. How old he was he when his dad died? Nine. And Lola, who was a Korean teacher, <laughs> as a mother, because they come, used to shinny up after him and try talking to him. And then one day, Phyllis and I had a carpool, which, you know, I, I took over Michelle's carpooling. And uh, I drove the kids to school in the morning, and she picked them up in the afternoon. And she stopped by my house one day, and she said, um, I uh, hate to snitch on the child. I, I really... Uh, hate to do this, but uh, there are times that I have to be able to leave school promptly, and I can't wait around all that time for David to come down from the tree. And I said, what are you talking about? And then she told me that day after day she stands there trying to coax him down from the tree, and he won't get down. And she said, I try to handle it the best way I know. And I said, how dare you? How dare you take it on yourself? to decide how to handle my child who's having a problem. How dare you not, you know, neglect to tell me about the problem. Mm-hmm. So I was furious with her. That's the way our friendship began. <laughs> how did you handle it with him? I don't remember. I think I just talked mm-hmm. to Lori about it, and I think that's when they got the male teacher. Mm-hmm. I didn't ask them to do that, but mm-hmm. that's what they did. Do they, do they ever if not directly to you, then to each other, that you hear talk about the years after their dad? Not too much. I don't know that. I know that last year I heard, uh, I, I, I told some incident, and Tony, Tony chuckled and said, that's one I never heard. Um, 
but he, he chuckled with real pleasure. It was a story about his father. And, but I do hear them say every once in a while, um, or they t I hear them tell uh, their kids something about your grandfather used to, or my father used to do, the, mm -hmm. you know, the following. Uh, mm -hmm. they, so they do remember more than they ever have said they remember mm -hmm. to me. And discuss with yeah. you. Well, I think that, you see, I was very... Uh, Bill Gorman at the center in Santa Barbara once said to me, uh, you do a magnificent job in keeping him alive for the children. And uh, once I said to David, I said something about, well, at least I've kept his memory alive. He said, for yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that must be true, that I did it for myself. Uh, I thought, uh, again, another lovely self-deception, that I was uh, keeping his memory alive for them. And because he, he really, he didn't want children. He so badly did not want children. And once he had children, he was such a good father and such a devoted father. And, uh, and a wise one. Mm -hmm. It's just a pity the, uh, The boys were deprived, and they were deprived at a very serious age. Really, uh, uh, you c could not ask if you had to lose a parent. You could not lose a parent at a worse period. For especially for David, exactly, yeah, you know, especially for David. Who did they have in their teenage years? Was there a man in your life, uh, sort of on a constant basis at all during those years? Um, they. Um, the man, the first man I got involved with after Michelle's death was Sidney Weinberg, who was a physicist. He had worked with Pauling mm -hmm. uh, on the experiments on molecular de deviation, which won Pauling a, uh, his first uh, uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, I don't mean that Sidney necessarily had anything to do with it, but I mean he, he was part uh, of that uh, of the staff. And Weinberg. Uh, Left Caltech uh, and left and left Pauling uh, when the war broke out because he wanted to make some direct uh, contribution to the war. He went to work for General Electric in Schenectady, mm -hmm. in New York, and invented a couple of things that uh, General mm -hmm. Electric uh, uh, copyrighted uh, that were very helpful in uh, some and in some instruments for war purposes. And in order to get that job with General Electric, he had to sign an affidavit that I am not now or never have been a member of the Communist Party. So after the war, he went back to Caltech to work and with, with pooling. And the FBI came around and uh, asked if the affidavit he had signed when he went to uh, work for General Electric was true. And Sidney thought back very fast. He thought, well, see, I was in a, a group with Oppenheimer. Uh, not Robert, but the brother, who, the one who mm -hmm. uh, invented the exploratorium. exploratorium. Huh? Yeah. Was it Frank? Frank. He was in a group with Frank, and he had known Robert uh, as well. And he thought, you know, who did he know? Uh, none of these people would talk. And uh, so he said, you know, they, they called him into the office of the president, at Caltech. So he was just being brazen and brazening it out instead of saying that was for the war effort and I have a principle against not doing that because the five, the statute had already run on that oath. But by signing a new statement that the oath was accurate, he reinst uh, reinstated it. And so he went to jail for five years for perjury because Oppenheimer had mentioned him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Sidney... How did you meet him and get I involved? I met him at Pauline Schindler's house. And um, if ever I should have married again, I should have married Sidney. He was absolutely mad for my boys. He loved them. And they liked being around him, too. He didn't last long with me because he was so in love with me and so admiring of me 
never a word of criticism, and I was indignant that he should think that, you know, he could have Michelle's woman. Mm-hmm. Um, he really, uh, I mean, he was a very nice man. Mm-hmm. He was a very nice man. And if ever I made a mistake, it was that. Um, he used to sit at a chair and read to me, and he read, he had a very thick Russian accent, but he read to me just beautifully. Um, he knew music very well. Uh, by the time he got out of jail, uh, the discoveries in physics were so specialized uh, and so uh, advanced that he could no longer work as a physicist. So he got a job because he could use the slide rule and if somebody, in, in a dress factory. And they would show him a model and they'd look at the number of buttons there and he would look at previous sales for, for styles that were similar like it and he would make some estimates and they would buy that many but- buttons based on his estimates, that much ribbon, that much material. They saved a fortune by the <laughs> fact that he, he was so accurate, mm-hmm. so good a mathematician, um, or a statistician, I, don't, I guess. Um, he made much more money than ever made at Caltech. <laughs> Not funny? Anyway, Sidney continued to call me about once every year to find out how I was. And he, I was very often impatient with the boys, and it's the only criticism he ever made of me. He'd say, it, it hurts me. It hurts me when you yell at them. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're just the same spot as you are. <laughs> so Sydney didn't last long with me. And then, uh, except for occasional people, there was Nathan Sherman, whom I saw for a couple of years, I guess. And David said he rather liked Nathan, which surprised me, because Nathan was mean to them. And Nathan was an alcoholic. You know, I had the same delusion that most people have, that you change know, I could change it, I could make life so good for him that I could change it. This is before you went to Santa Barbara? Yeah. And uh, apparently he was not mean to them, the kids in front of them. Mm-hmm. They didn't pick it up, but they would, oh God, he was so mean about them. He Gee. was so jealous of them, really. I never would have married him because I didn't trust him around the boys. Mm-hmm. I just didn't trust him. And then, of course, I broke off with him for totally different reasons. I discovered one day we were we had gone away to Palm Springs, and uh, I didn't talk about my husband much because he was so jealous. But one day, and he was very drunk, he said, I am so tired about hearing about your husband's martyrdom. And I said, I, I swear to you, Ronnie, you can trust me on this. I never, never uh, spoke about Michelle's martyrdom to him. And I, But what came out afterwards, immediately, and tumbling out after this charge, was the fact that he had been a friendly witness. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, so he'd been guilty, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. His brother-in-law had been a friendly witness, and I remember once he asked me to go and have dinner with his sister, and I said, "Well, you, the brother-in-law will be there." And he said, "No, they're divorced." And I said, "That doesn't mean that he won't be there because people sometimes are friendly." Mm-hmm. And I said, "Don't ever put me in a position where I have to be in the same room with him." Mm-hmm. And he said, "Well, you don't have no objection to being with me." And I said, "Well, you didn't do it. It's your brother-in-law who did it." I said, your sister didn't do it. I wouldn't go to her house either. So he knew where I stood, mm-hmm. but he lied to me. And uh, when, when did Lucy move to Rome? When were the years when you said you would go and visit her there? Well, I didn't that go was visit her until 1961. When you were up in Santa Barbara? By I had not yet uh, uh, gone to Santa Barbara. Uh, I had... It was in the summer... It was in the, uh, I had to go in the summer because the kids would be at summer camp. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was in April or May of 1961 that, in the, uh, in the trying to figure out why I had such headaches, they did spinal tap and uh, then they did some kind of, um, it wouldn't be an x ray because, uh, well, yeah, I guess it was an x ray of my head. And they decided I had a tumor 
uh, was growing, but they didn't know whether it was inside the door or outside the door. If, if it was inside the door, then it, you know, I just it was a question of time. If it was outside the door, then it wouldn't bring any pressure on the, you know, the, the brain itself. And that was kind of scary, but we were going to wait a year. And, and Phyllis's brother, who was a neurosurgeon that operated on Patricia Neal, uh, would look at me again in a year's time. But Lucy was enormously agitated when she heard about that, and she sent me money for to come and visit her in Rome. At the same time, when that this happened, because uh, I couldn't have accepted the invitation under ordinary circumstances, but I had decided to leave Arthur. And Ted Strauss, who was made head of the story department at 20th, 20th Century Fox, asked me to come and be in, in, in charge of the story department. Mm -hmm. And um, so I asked him if I could show up for work in, after Labor Day so that I could go to Europe for the summer. And he said, yes, it would be okay. And um, so I went to, first to Israel. And by that time, I had met someone and was supposed to meet him in Athens. And that's when I made that, uh, wrote that short, short, short story uh, on the day that her lover jilted her, her menopause mm -hmm. began, because he didn't show up. He's now one of my very best friends. Oh, God. Uh, uh, but, uh, so I was involved with somebody that boys liked a lot, but that didn't last very long, because he, he left me. But, uh, I got back from the summer in Europe and get ready to report to 20th Century Fox and the studio closed down, facing bankruptcy. So I was in, I was in a panic. Well, uh, if you've read the, the introduction to that book I did, Palimpsest, uh, you'll remember that Samuel was a director of Pacifica Radio and he was a director at the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. And he used to go up there regularly to hear the meetings. And he thought, my God, this is terrible. Just a few guests get to hear this, and those, just those few things that get published. But here's a wonderful conversation, which everybody wanted to be hearing. Okay. So he got the notion that it should be broadcast over Pacifica. And as a director, he told them that he wanted them to do it. And they said, sure, fine, if the center uh, was willing. And he told the center, and they said, okay, and they hired Peter Steffens, Lincoln Steffens' son. Uh, and uh, uh, Peter Steffens went up there for a month and a half and sat around listening. And then he was offered a job in the English department at Berkeley and decided he wanted that. So they were without a radio producer. Mm -hmm. And I came over to tell them that... I didn't have a job at 20th Century Fox, and I would be looking for work. To tell the Astros? Yeah, I, I always came by to visit them mm -hmm. several times a week anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I left the house and went back to my house, and I was then living in Reseda. By the time I got there, the phone was ringing as I walked in, and it was Samuel saying, I have a job for you. And he uh, told me about the job at the center. And uh, so I went there. And the first reaction was, oh, but you're a woman. I, I was the first noticed. woman, yeah. I was the first woman to sit in that room That's day wonderful. after day as a member of the staff. And I had to be interviewed by every one of the, well, not all of them. I think I was interviewed by seven people, six or seven people. And not one of them knew how to interview me. I had to, I had to make the conversation happen mm -hmm. so that they would interview me, you know, and, and, and get them to ask me questions. And by the time again, another Hutchins story, by being fresh. The one man I revered, you know, um, <laughs> he's the last one I go to see. I'm exhausted by the time I get into his office. And I, I sashayed in and I said to him, I understand that my being a woman is a, is a handicap here and that that's uh, going to count against me. And I don't intend to apologize for it because I enjoy being a woman. And he said, oh, not at all, not at all. It's just that... Uh, You'll be a problem. And I said, Mr. Hutchins, I wish that were true. <laughs> oh. I said, but I can assure you I will not be a problem. Not as he meant it. Mm -hmm. And uh, So the first time you went 
there in, to Rome was in the summer of 60, and then you... 61. 61. 61. And then you went back some more times? Cause you, remember you oh, I went to... back, I, I went back after that, uh, oh, I did, uh, I don't remember when the next time that I went back was, because uh, I would have been in Santa Barbara, and I would I never have taken, I never took a whole summer off again. I would go back for two weeks, you know, for a vacation mm -hmm. or something like that as the kids were in camp. Mm -hmm. So I went about uh, every other week, because by that time, you see, Gertie was then working at TWA. So and she put, kids. well, she, you are allowed to get, you were allowed in those years to have a pass for your mother. So she very quickly said, uh, does that go for a stepmother too? And they said, yes, but not in the same year. You're not both of them at the same time, or in, you know, or in the same year. So uh, she said, I'm crazy about my stepmother. We're more like sisters. I mean, you know, and she says, really, she's not much older than I am. My, my father really, and she went on and on like that, and I was a stepmother. So I could go. You know, the first time Lucy sent me the money for the ticket, but thereafter, I, I, I just flew standby. That and wonderful? that continued until my mother died. Okay. When my mother died, the TWA people came to the funeral, and I, not thinking, not <laughs> thinking, <laughs> when, that they were there, said, it was, I started out the eulogy by saying it was not easy to be Rosie's daughter, and gave it away. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the end of my passes. <laughs> Thank God Gertie didn't get, you know, she, she left a few years after that, but I could no longer get a pass for <laughs> Tell me some of those stories you've told me before about how Lucy and you used to laugh together. Oh God, we did laugh. We really, I, I, I can't remember at this minute the incidents, but we laughed so hard. No, no. We talked about it last time, as a matter of fact, when I was visiting her, I said, remember how we used to laugh? We laughed a lot. We screeched with laughter. We shrieked with laughter and danced. God, how we danced. This was in Rome? Or yeah, her? yeah, yeah. Once Lucy's uh, guy, Fausto, um, went after me. This is after they moved to... Uh, he kept wanting to have an affair with me, and I kept saying, well, you, you know, I, I threatened to tell Lucy about it. And he said, ever since I saw you dance in Rome, <laughs> <laughs> I said, if you don't stop bothering me, I'm going to tell Lucy. Oh, so the next thing I knew, he came back to me one day and he said, I told Lucy, and she says, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, she was making a joke, and don't you forget that you're making it a joke. It isn't all right. Yeah. <laughs> so... You want yeah. to talk a little bit about Rosie? Oh. Well, she's been dead now. How many years? When did I have my bypass? Uh, she's probably dead since the mid 81, I guess. Huh? Since 81? She died in 81. Rosie, was, Rosie went to the hospital on Thursday, and I went to the hospital on Friday. Rosie was operated on emergency Sunday, and I was operated on emergency Monday. And she, yeah. In the years since she's died, have you have you come to see her any differently than you did when you, when she was alive, or did that already change over the years? Um, no, I. I uh, well, clearly, I, I I don't get upset with her. She, you know, I don't get uh, irritated with her and and, and uh, uh, snappy with her, and then feel guilty because I uh, have failed to do what David once a long time ago cautioned me. David said, "Why don't you um, see? Why don't you hear what she means and not what she says?" Because she really had a way of putting things in such a negative frame all the time that, uh, you know, she, could just, she would drive me up the wall a lot of the time. But the last years with my mother were, on the whole, in, in spite of occasional temper blasts on my part, um, they were very good. Uh, when we've talked sometimes about her, though, it seemed as though 
<laughs> I'm trying to think of what was it she said. You were the what? The ugly one? Is that what she was? Yeah, I was it? Misa. The Misa, which is the ugly one. Um, well, they had, they, they, I, was, I was the Misa. Uh, Gertie was the, uh, what do they call her? The, uh, the stupid one, the, uh, the Nar. I, yeah, I was the Misa, Gertie was the Nar, the fool, and Leah was the Pisk, the mouth. All of those <laughs> negatives. But that, yeah. and was that sort of a, a, a part of, not just her, but a part of that world? That yeah, you sort yeah. Of As a matter of fact, there's a story I tell. I, 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 I've written a short story, and uh, that's why uh, Lee Stimmel and uh, um, Jennison, uh, um, the, uh, he was formerly an editor at Vikings, have been after me to write the Rosie stories. Because I wrote one called My Beautiful Mama uh, that um, catches that, that negative grain, but that's the way Jews were. And in that, they were not too different from other ethnic groups. I hear stories about the Chinese mm -hmm. who don't value uh, girls. Uh, holding up a girl child to the gods and saying, you know, a, an adorable little girl and saying, look at this ugly little pockmark creature. Mm -hmm. She's worthless and, uh, you know, it would be well if you, you know, if you want to take her. But as long as she's this worthless, we'll keep her. You know, if, if you'll, you, you, you want to uh, uh, avoid the evil eye, don't evoke the jealousy mm -hmm. of the gods. Mm -hmm. And so everything is negative. And, uh, I, but in that short story, I tell the story uh, in, in the short story that I wrote, I tell about the incident of a woman who sees an American sitting on the stoop of one of these uh, ghetto apartment buildings, and she's got a child in her lap, and she's kissing her and, and hugging her. And the girl, the woman goes, uh, the girl goes running to her mother, and says, "Mama, Mama, come!" This is all in Yiddish, you know. Come and look. If there's a, a woman, she sits on the stoop, and she's got a child on her lap, and she kisses her, and she kisses her. And the mother says, uh, so, with 14 children, who has time? You know, uh, 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 <laughs> it's, uh, uh, they tell another story about a man who, who comes from Israel to uh, speak, and one, one member of the audience after another gets up and says, Mr. Speaker, I beg to differ with you about this. And the other one says, uh, and I think you were wrong about this, and I think you were overlooked to say this. And he says, lady, ladies, in my whole speech, didn't I say one good thing? And they said, no, who needs to improve on the good? You know, and that was my mother's attitude. Who needs to improve on the good? I mean, the good takes care of itself. It's just exactly the opposite of modern uh, mm -hmm. psychology exactly. today. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, was uh, she better with her grandsons? Oh, she was then? good. Yeah. Good. Uh, Tony never had too much of a relationship with her, but Jolie, uh, uh, Lucy's Gertie's, girl? No, uh, Jolie, jo Joanne, uh, uh, 